Second Chronicles 25 Amaziah was twenty and five years old when he began to reign. He reigned twenty and nine years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Jehoiada, or Jehoiadan of Jerusalem. He did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, but not with a perfect heart. All right, so now we're seeing again, Israel is lacking, but Judah, we see good kings, we see bad kings. Now here's a king that, you know, he did what was right, but his heart wasn't truly after God. It wasn't pure. Uh, and that's what God wants. That's what the whole thing of a motive is, what God wants. God wants a pure heart. God wants your your relationship, your doings. He wants it from your heart. For he tells in the scriptures, you know, with all your with your heart, mind, and soul. He doesn't want head religion. Your heart is the source of what you love, of what you desire, of what you're going to do. And not having a perfect heart is very dangerous in this day and age. Because if the government were to come to us Christians today and say, okay, renounce your religion or die. If your heart's not perfect, you're not going to die. Plain and simple. You'll give in. You'll quit. Demas' heart was not perfect before the Lord, but yet Paul's was. At a time, Mark... His heart wasn't pure for the Lord. And then Paul later on tells us that, you know, Mark got right. He, he got a perfect heart for the Lord. He, he continued to serve the Lord and do. You got to decide today. And if you don't have a perfect heart, you can't say, I'm going to die for Jesus. Or I'm going to do this for Jesus. Or whatever, or what have you. Because if it's not a perfect heart, you're not going to do nothing for Jesus when the pressure is put on and the Bible says, all, that li all they that will live godly shall suffer persecution. And if your heart's not perfect, you're not going to suffer persecution. You'll quit. And I've seen too many. As soon as the heat gets turned on, they quit. Now it came to pass when the kingdom was established to him. All right, Established to him means he was made king rightfully, lawfully. He was put in charge. He is now king. That he slew the servants that had killed the father of his, that had killed the king, his father. Rightfully so. Capital punishment upon the ones who committed murder. That's an Old Testament law. That's a law that goes today. Romans chapter 13. If you shed man's blood purposely, knowingly, your blood shall be shed. And God says if you don't, the land cries out, the blood cries to him for revenge. But he slew not the children, but did as it was written in the law of the book of Moses, where the Lord commanded Moses, The father shall not die for the children, neither shall the children die for the fathers, for every man shall die for his own sin. All right, he's obeying the word. He's obeying what the law says. Now, why would this thing be put in here? Um... He went after the men that committed the crime, not the children. That's in there for a reason. Maybe they were in Israel. Maybe they were killing the sons of, of criminals, too. That's not what you were to do. You did that, and you know, you, Amaziah's father did, got, did wrong. The Bible says the person that done the deed pays the penalty. You don't pass that on to children. Only thing that God passes on to children is the worship of idols, the second commandment. Well that's something that the parents pass on to the children, the children pass on to their children. Moreover Amaziah gathered Judah together <clears throat> and made them captains over thousands, captains over hundreds, according to the houses of their fathers throughout all Judah and Benjamin. And he numbered them from 20 years old and above, and found them 300,000 choice men able to go forth to war that he could handle, that could handle spear and shield. Okay, what he's doing now, he was, he, he's gathering uh, 
a draft. What America calls a draft. He's going through Israel. He's looking at the men. And he's like, okay, you're fit for service. You stand over here. That's number one. Okay, you're not fit for service. You're 4F. You, you, you're you fit for service. You can handle the spear and the shield. All right, you're over there at number two. And it goes all the way up to uh, 300,000 men that he chooses out to be in the military. That's what he's doing. He's hand-picking the men. I'm not going to say what I'm going to say. It's amazing how we have women in the military today. One woman today at the Navy office, she was going to go off to boot camp. They would drive her up to Tallahassee or wherever they drive. And from there, she would go to San Diego or Michigan. A woman. And it's funny because she asked, because she's already signed all the paperwork and uh, done her oath on that. She asked the question, well, what happens if I get pregnant? What, we got to count, we got to call off war because three quarters of our troops are pregnant and they got to go home? Amazing, a country that take a woman that man is supposed to protect, that she's supposed to be under a man, her father or her husband. If she leaves her father, she's under her husband for protection. And even when you read in the Bible, if her husband dies, if she's got sons, she goes under her sons. A widow with a fatherless. And today the things that man in America puts women to subject to. He hired also a hundred thousand mighty men of valor out of Israel for a hundred talents of silver. Now don't you see what's wrong with that one? Israel is part of the 12 tribes of Israel, uh, you know, Jacob. They are brethren, yes. He hires these men out of Israel, but these men of Israel are not and have not been serving God. They've been through the 400, the 400 prophets of Jezebel. They've been through the prophets of Baal. They've been through the two golden calves, one in Bethel and one in uh, Dan. they got their own priests up there. They don't come down to, to Jerusalem. To worship God. If they do, they do it sneakily, and it's very few. He's hiring men who are against God. Well, that's not the kind of people you want to you want in your military. What are you going to do when you get in problem? The, you know, everyone pray. Well, here's a group of men that God won't hear. They're enemies of God, even though they're Jews, because they got their own religion. And that may be where part where it says not with a perfect heart. He, you know, I mean, if you're going to have a man, if you're going to have an army, have them all with those that love God and want to do right. Then you're you're going to be victorious. I don't care if you have no weapons. But there came a man of God to him, saying, "O king, let not the army of Israel go with thee, for the Lord is not with Israel." And I told you that. To wit, that means. Here's information, extra information, with all the children of Ephraim. So God, he hires these men, and God says, okay, prophet, go speak to the king. I got a message. Yes, sir. He says, you got Ephraim there. You read in the Bible, Ephraim says, Ephraim's joined the idols, let him alone. Ephraim is a half-baked half person. Uh, I can't think of the book right now. It mentions Hosea. I mean, no, uh, it mentions Ephraim. But these are not the people you want. They don't. God, it, what he says, God is not with Israel. So if God's not with Israel, do you think God will be with the armies of Judah if he continues? So let me ask you a question. If you bring people into your church who are not with God who are not doing what God wants them to do and you hire and bring them in the church and their numbers and they you know they put something in the collection plate and all that and that makes you happy but where God says I'm not with them what's the problem you know there's more of the world than there are Christians and if you allow your church to get Israel in there when you're Judah, 
you're going to have more Israelites in your church than Judeans. And then you got an out of balance church where there's more against God than there are for God. But if thou will go, do it. Be strong for the battle. God shall make thee fall before the enemy. For God has power to help and to cast down. He's saying, listen, I'll, I'll give you a warning. You better get rid of these people. If you don't do it, I'm going to be against you. Well, listen, that, that, comes, that comes close to home with Joash. When Joash starts doing wrong and he kills the priest, well, guess what? God sends in the Syrian, the, the, the enemy, and he goes in there and starts destroying And with the church today, you got these people in the church that don't belong in the church. They have nothing to do with God, but, you know, it, it fills in numbers and fills in the play. Isn't that hunky-dory? And God says, listen, I'm against you. Read Revelation chapter 3. Jesus Christ is standing outside the church. It's filthy inside the church. And what did Jesus do when he's standing outside the door? He's calling them out. Not in. And God tells uh, the Amaziah, if you keep them, I'm going to be against you. But if you get rid of them, I'll give you power, and I'll help you. There's no power in the churches today. Compare uh, how many churches in Yellow Pages compared to package stores in the Yellow Pages. I'll tell you how much power they got. Add tattoo powers, add pubs and bars, and add uh, anything else that's wicked. And then how many churches there are. I'll show you how much power there is. Take a church and take a five block radius around that church. What's around that church? Listen, there was a time in America when preachers came in, all the adulterers, all the bars shut down, and everyone that was in sin would hide. If a man was going to commit adultery with his wife, he'd do it in the middle of the night where no one would know about it and hide from it. Today, they do it right on television so everyone can watch. And Amaziah said to the man of God, But what shall we do for a hundred towns which I have given to the army of Israel? He said, Well, I, I paid these guys. What do I do with the money? And the man of God answered, The Lord is able to give thee much more than this. Take the loss. Did you hear that? To have a pure church, get rid of those who don't really want to do anything for God, who don't want to serve God, who don't want to be right with God, and just God will, God will take your offerings and make them much better. You know, you get church today, all are welcome. That's a most sickening, disgusting thing. And they're not just saying that, you know, come in, we'll witness to you. They don't get anything of a witness out of the sissy, pansy messages these preachers get are so watered down you need to build an ark. They mean for them to come in, sit down, and be regular members of the church. You got people today that get disciplined out of a Bible-believing church for a rightful thing, and they just go right down the street, go to the next church. Oh, okay, that's okay. Yeah, come on. How mean they are. We'll never treat you like that. So the man of God tells Amaziah, don't worry about that money. God, God will bless it even more for you. Amaziah separated them to where the army that was come to to him out of Ephraim to go home again. Wherefore their anger was greatly kindled against Judah, and they returned home in great anger. Amaziah said, "Go home. We don't want you here." Well, who do you think you are, preacher? I know who I think I am. I'm obeying the word of God. Now get out of here. I made a mistake. I confessed it. For us, we put it under the blood. For Amaziah, he would go to the temple, offer an offering. You guys cannot stay here. You don't want to get right. You don't want to have anything to do with God. You just keep the money and go. I only want those that love the Lord and want to do right.
Go start your own fancy, fancy, dancy, wancy, fancy church. Oh, by the way, there's a whole bunch of them. Just go join in any of them. They're a dime a dozen. You probably get a coupon. We only want those who will serve God. If we only get a preacher to do that today in the church, you'd be lucky if you get him and his family sitting there in the pew. All these vacation Bible garbage things are coming up. Makes me sick. Tell them, go home, and they got angry. You know what God told you? You're going to tell those people, listen, you're going to do right or not do good, not do anything at all, and they're going to get angry at you. But they're not angry with you. They're angry with God because God told them that. And Amaziah strengthened himself and led forth his people and went to the valley of Saul and smote of the children of Seir 10,000. Now imagine if he were taken Israel or more specifically Ephraim with him. He might have lost 10,000. He knows how it's recorded. It doesn't record anything about him losing anybody. He did what, and listen, they're, they're going to spoil. That spoils a lot more than 100 talents of silver. Imagine what they're going to get off these, these dead bodies. A lot better than taking the people who don't want to serve the Lord, taking Ephraim or Israel with them, and losing himself and the, and the enemy spoiling from them. And you come out with even more of a negative. Two wrongs don't make a right. He does right. He obeyed the preacher. He obeyed the man of God. And look what happened. Another 10,000 left alive to the children of Judah carry away captive and brought them unto the top of the rocks. And cast them down upon the top of the rock that they were all that they all were broken in pieces. Wow, you see that's that's a wicked thing. That's warfare. Israel is saying, listen, we're serious about this. We're serious about the enemies of God. We're going to destroy and kill you. And imagine taking that and saying, you know. Thou shalt not kill. They're in a war time. Now it would have been different with peace. Like his father was killed in peace time. That was murder. But the soldiers of the army which Amaziah sent back, that they should not go with him to battle, fell upon the cities of Judah with Samaria, even unto Beth Haran, and smote three thousand of them and took much spoil. Oh boy, the people he the people that he told to get out of the church went back to the church and caused a church split. And took a lot of people with them. Standing up for God, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. You may have a church split. You may have somebody come in and, and take away. That's a rule of life. They already told you, God already told you they were angry. They were angry enough to come back and destroy and kill people of Judah. Isn't that great? Fell upon the cities of Judah, from Samaria even to Beth Aram. Samaria is the capital of Israel at this point. And they just go south and just start killing. They caused a civil war over the preacher told them, you don't want to serve God and do right, get out of here. And their actions prove loud and clear they didn't want to serve God. Because the next thing they do is they go and murder. That runs all the way back to the story of Cain and Abel. Abel says, I got the joy, joy, joy down deep in my heart. And Cain says, well, I'll just kill you. Because I can't stand that joy. Your God is ruined, proven, wouldn't take my offering, but he took yours. So here, die. Things haven't changed. And if you take a stand, if a church takes a stand today, say, we're going to serve God, we're going to do it right, we're going to do it scripture, I don't care what nobody says, I, what God says, 
If you don't like it, you can leave. You can guarantee there will be troubles inside the church. I guarantee you by next Sunday morning, you're going to find a big change in your church. And maybe a new church down the street. Or another another Baptist church will be happy because he's got more members coming to his church because says all are welcome. I wouldn't want a church of people who would do stuff like this. And he hired these guys. These are the guys who take a grenade and throw it into your own tent. Your own men. This is the kind of person who will go into your own camp and start shooting your own soldiers. These are the people who sit there and gossip about the people in the church to hurt them. These are people who set the people against them. Where one of the things that it says seven things that the Lord hates is the uh, oh, can't think of this right now. Well, this is um not this man, but it's over there in Proverbs. I can't think of it. Discord. Discord. Thank you. These are the ones who cause discord to brother. Because isn't it some great discord right here? They killed a whole bunch of their family while they're away. Isn't that great? This is like David coming back from battle and Ziglag's been taken. Everybody's about to kill him. Now you really got the preacher or the king here. You got him really upset. Now what is all this happening? So what happens when you take a stand? So what happens when you want to do right? You think God's going to appreciate when one third of the angels in heaven are going to be cast to the ground with Satan? You think God really going to appreciate sending people off to hell because of Satan? Satan loves to come in and do the, the, the Listen, the foundation of this is not really Ephraim. It's not really Israel. It's Satan. Sometimes you've got to clean house. And when you clean house, you don't. Well, listen, one of the things is when you start taking body, you're like, oh, wow, what's that? I don't, you know, junk. I did that today. Went through a box and saw a lot of stuff that needed to go. Bye bye. I don't need it no more. And Israel takes much spoil from Judah. Now it came to pass after Amaziah was gone from the slaughter of the Edomites that he brought the gods of the children of Assyria. Oh, look at this. And set them up to be his gods. And bowed down himself before them and burned incense on them. Now isn't this a stupid thing? These gods are so strong that 10,000 men of Seir were killed. By Israel, I'm by Judah. Great God, let ten thousand of his people get killed. And what does uh, King Amaziah do in return? He picks up the losing gods and say, "You're mine." Aren't you cute, you little god laying on the ground there? Aren't you so precious with all the dead people? You really protect your people. You really did a good job, God. Here, let me pick you up and take dust you off and take you home and clean you up. You say it don't happen. We just read the story. It did happen. He has a losing god where he had the winning god. You remember he didn't have a perfect heart? Look at that. His perfect heart turned, the lack of a perfect heart, turned from God to gods. And he hasn't even gone home yet to realize what the trouble was or has happened. He's still on the battlefield. Wherefore the anger of the Lord was kindled against Amaziah, and he sent to him a prophet. This is the second prophet that comes to him. Which said to him, Why hast thou sought after the gods of the people, which could not deliver their own people out of thy hand? You know what God just said there? Why did you pick up a losing God? Why are you worshiping a loser? You probably got those gods out of a dead man's hand, or a dead man's neck, or his pocket, wherever it was, and didn't you just realize that the that God was a loser? And it came to pass as he talked with him that the king said unto him, 
Thou, oh, excuse me, art thou made of the king's council? Forbear. Why shouldst thou be smitten? Oh, he's acting like his father now. Father slew the priest, the one that helped him. Then the prophet forbeared, said, I know that God has determined to destroy thee because thou hast done this and hast not hearkened unto my covenant. Now look at that pastor. That, that man of God. God told him, okay, don't say anything else. Let him die. That's it, Lord. That's all you want me to That's all I want you to say. Okay. Because God already knew the heart. He already told you what the heart was. He was not going to get right. And if you have a half-hearted thing for God, and you're in such a mess you are in right now, you're not going to get right. Now, had he had a perfect heart and tried willingly to, to do what the Lord wanted to do, and at this point in his life, if he would fall, if his heart was perfect, he would have listened to his preacher. He would say, well, what do I need to do? What, I, I didn't realize. I'm sorry. God, help me now. I, but he doesn't do that. He tells the preacher, shut up. And there are preachers out there when an evangelist or a missionary comes in, they'll say, don't preach this. Don't say this. Matter of fact, if you're a missionary, you just give us your little slide present presentation, and you just tell us about, you're not even going to preach. You're just going to tell us about what you do, and that's it. And maybe we'll have time for questions. We don't want to rock the boat. Because you don't know the people in the church and you may some, say something against them. And if I got to go try to fight to bring them back. Then Amaziah the king of Judah took advice and sent to Joash the son of Jehoaz, the son of Jehu, king of Israel, saying, Come, let us see one another in the face. He's going up to Israel again. Man, this has been happening since Jehoshaphat. And Joash, king of Israel, sent to Amaziah, the king of Judah, saying, Now this is the king of Israel speaking, The thistle that was in Lebanon sent to the cedar that was in Lebanon, saying, Give thy daughter to my son to wife. And thou passed by a wild beast that was in Lebanon, trod down the thistle. Thou sayest, Lo, thou hast smitten the Edomites, which he did, and thy heart lifted thee up to boast. You got pride. Pride. Abide now at home. Get out of here. Imagine the king of Israel telling him, get out of here. Why shouldst thou meddle to thy hurt? That thou shouldst fall, even thou, and Judah with thee. He says, listen, you stick around here. You're going to die, and Judah is going to fall with you. Get out of here. Sometimes even the world knows what the Christian is supposed to do. And sometimes the Christians will rebuke the Christian. I've been there. I remember a friend of mine I had was unsaved. I witnessed to him. I remember the greatest rebuke that he told me. I'll never forget it. I was in a bar room shooting pool, drinking beer, and he said, Is that what Christ wants you to do? I'm an unsaved man. I'll tell you one thing, I got right, repented, straightened up my life. Let's see what let's see what this king does. Amaziah, let's see what he does. He's been rebuked by a king in a region that doesn't want God. God already said that because in verse 7 he says, I'm not with Israel. So a God-forsaken nation speaks to a king that's supposed to, who has Judah, who has the priest. Let's see what happens. But Amaziah would not hear. Thank God that wasn't me. I thank God that was not me. I thank God that God said, knock me across the head and said, what about that, you idiot? Now, throw those marble t-shirts away, 
throw those Newport t-shirts away and stop witnessing passing the gospel tracts out wearing them. Yeah, I used to wear, I used to witness and pass out gospel tracts wearing Marlboro and Newport t-shirts that came free in the cartons. You better believe they went in the garbage can real quick. I'm only sorry I took my rock music and all that and sold it in the yard sale. I should have burned them. I didn't know any better. But he did not hear. For it came of God, because he didn't have a perfect heart, that he might deliver them into the hand of their enemies, because they sought after the gods of Edom. That's Esau. That's the one who sell themselves out for, for beans. Edom's a type of flesh. So it was a fleshy God. It was a carnal God. Oh, nothing carnal today, is there, in the church? No. So Joash, the king of Israel, went up, and they saw one another in the, in the face. Both he and Amaziah, king of Judah, at Beth Shemesh, which belongeth to Judah. They're one on one. This is what you're going to call head to head combat. The king of Israel, Joash, warned Amaziah. He says, Don't you come up here. You're going to lose. Judah was put to the worst before Israel. And they fled every man to his tent. Imagine that. Imagine the ones that were supposed to be for God get whipped by the, by the ones against God. Imagine that testimony. It's written in the Bible. How many years is this recorded? That the ones who, didn't, who God said, I am not with them, destroys them that were supposed to be with them. But he chose losing God, so God says, hey, that's the God you want? Okay, let's go. One-on-one. -on -one. I'll show you how good those gods, are, those gods are, Amaziah. You'll be like the Edomites, dead. So Joash the king of Israel went up and saw one to another. In the face both he and Amaziah, king of Judah, at Beth Shemesh, which belonged to Judah. And Judah was put to the worst before Israel, and they fled every man to his tent. And Joash, the king of Israel, took Amaziah, the king of Judah, the son of Joash, the son of Jehoaz, at Beth Shemesh, and brought him to Jerusalem, and break down the wall of Jerusalem from the gate of Ephraim to the corner gate, 400 cubits. He comes down with the king of Judah and destroys the wall. You know what you do if you allow these people who are forsaken by God into your church? They're going to forsake. They're going to break down your church. While you're there watching it. And he took all the gold and silver. And all the vessels that were found in the house of God. With Obadiah and the treasures of the king's house. The hostages also. And returned to Samaria. Look at all that he got. Man he goes in the house of God. He takes all the gold and silver. Goes in the king's house. And takes hostages. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, the son of. And Amaziah, the son of Joash, king of Judah, lived after the death of Joash, the son of Jehoaz, king of Israel, fifteen years. Oh. Oh. You mean Amaziah stayed behind when? Israel came down and tore the wall apart, went in the house of God, went to King's house, grabbed all the gold and all that and all the silver and the hostages and left the king there in front of his people. And the people looked at him like, what on earth just happened? King, what just happened? Explain to us. How did we lose the war? We just fought Edom. We just killed 10,000 people of Edom. How did we lose this war? Tell us. Well, I started worshiping other gods. He couldn't say that because that's a violation of the law. And the people knew it.
Look what happened by violating one commandment of the law. Now, we're not under the law, but Paul mentions all the commandments, all but one. That's honor the Sabbath. All he did is bring home a little dolly or whatever it was. That's all he did. And he burned incense to it. That's all he did. And God was so kind to send a preacher to him and say, Listen, what you're doing, shut up! But shut up. Preacher? Yeah. Don't tell him anymore. All right, Lord. Now, how Amaziah got his butt killed would have been plain and simple enough. But Amaziah did not die. A whole bunch of people in Israel and the city of Israel has been destroyed. The church has been destroyed. People's lives have been destroyed. Money has been taken because of one person in their sin. And don't tell me sin doesn't hurt others. Taking a piece of fruit that did not belong to him in violation of what God said, Thou shalt not eat, has been hurting us for over 2,013 years on this side of Calvary. Sin doesn't hurt. Now the rest of the acts of Amaziah, first and last, behold, are they not written in the books of the kings of Judah and Israel? That's kings proper, first and second. Now after the time that Amaziah did turn away from following the Lord, see, he turned away. He did a reversal of repenting. I don't even know what that word is. What is, out, what is complete opposite of repenting where you turn from wickedness to holiness? He turned from holiness to wickedness. He reversed repent. They made a conspiracy against him in Jerusalem. And he fled to, and he fled to Lachish. But they sent to Lachish after him. And like his father, they slew him there. Oh, some sins that father does, son will do too. Not always. That's not. That's not always a. You can't lay that ground proof. But look what happened here. He did exactly what his father done. He was right like his father, but then he got. And then he got. He changed like his father, just like his father, his father and son, and they both died the same way. But that's not a die-hard fact. There are some wicked fathers and boys that did right. It always did right and stayed right. And there are some fathers who did right, loved the Lord, praised the Lord, and their sons just turned out to be the devil. That happens. And they brought him upon horses and buried him in the buried him with his fathers in the city of Judah. And it knows how it doesn't say the city of David, it says the city of Judah with his fathers. So that's another king's life. That's another downfall of a king where he doesn't end up right. Started off right, but he didn't, didn't finish right. The churches. You say, why'd you keep bringing the churches? The church started off right with the 12 apostles. Look where we are today. Look where we are today. We're falling prodigal. America is falling. Listen, she had the foundation of the pilgrims, and look where we are today. One by one, each state now has turned to sodomite marriages. I just showed your mom a video yesterday where a guy's preaching on a sodomite marriage in San Francisco and somebody went up and pulled the horn right out of his face. And then he had one guy get in his face for 20, 25, 30 minutes. And the cops standing there, four, five, six, maybe 20 cops standing there they didn't do nothing to stop that guy from getting his face. But had the preacher gotten in the sodomite's face, oh, he'd be in jail right now. We've come a long way backwards.